right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our 2022 inaugural Henri M. Treadwell Distinguished Health Equity Lectureship. My name is Daniel Dawes, and I have the great honor of serving as the Executive Director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute here at Morehouse School of Medicine, where we are leading the advancement of health equity by creating systemic change at the intersection of policy and equity. It brings me great pleasure today to present to all of you yet another inaugural annual event in honor of a person who I respectfully call a colleague, mentor, and dear friend, Dr. Henri M. Treadwell. In fact, Dr. Treadwell is the first person I ever met <clears throat> from Morehouse School of Medicine when I started my career in health policy in the US Senate. There, she opened my eyes to the health injustices that were happening in the South, and specifically justice involved individuals when she brought a group of formerly incarcerated men of color to Congress to share their experiences. That was the very first time during my tenure in Congress that I had met individuals with lived experiences of which the, the policy that we were working on would have a direct impact. And so for that, I really appreciate that she did that for us. You see, this champion has been an extraordinary example of what it takes to disrupt the fortitude of structural isms plag plaguing our society, making strides to dismantle racism and sexism at some of the highest levels of systemic oppression. Dr. Treadwell comes from a lineage of activists to include her aunt, Majeska Simpkins, who was an esteemed matriarch of the civil rights movement in South Carolina. So it's no surprise that she would carry on the legacy as a health equity and social justice giant, answering the call to action to strategically address the unequal and unjust burdens that were purposely placed as roadblocks for marginalized populations. Dr. Treadwell began her journey as the first of many firsts. She was the first to graduate from the University of South Carolina since Reconstruction. Think about that. And the first African-American woman to, de to desegregate the university. But she didn't stop there. No, true to, true to her calling, she has since made many more advancements and honorable accomplishments in the health equity movement. Dr. Treadwell is the founding director of Community Voices Healthcare for the Underserved and Professor Emerita in the Department of Community Health and Preventive Medicine here at Morehouse School of Medicine. Prior to joining our school, she served for 17 years as Program Director of Health at the Kellogg Foundation and was responsible for grant making in the United States, Central and Latin America, Southern Africa, and China. Her expertise over the years has principally focused on the health and well being of poor boys and men of color and the impact of the criminal justice system, racism, poverty, and other determinants that affect their future potential. Her many peer-reviewed and popular publications were designed to increase our knowledge and will to change systems that disparately compromise the future of Black boys and men in communities across the world. Dr. Treadwell has received numerous honors and awards, including the Order of the Palmetto, um, the state of South Carolina's highest civilian award from Governor Nikki Haley back in 2014 for her work in social and health justice. And so it is with great honor and pleasure that we honor Dr. Henri Treadwell with this lectureship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Treadwell. Dr. Treadwell, the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, for that really wonderful um, introduction. I'm not sure um, where you found all that information, but evidently <laughs> you have been searching here and there. I am honored by this distinct program and the good that it will bring to many of us, to all of us. I am um, constantly thinking about how I got from there in South Carolina to all the other places around the world, quite frankly, and how I managed to think about health more broadly. And one of the issues that I recall 
in Wilcox County, Alabama, for example, I went there as a naive person saying, I'm going to do something for seniors for healthcare. And the community said, they don't have any potable drinking water. And I thought, well, I'm, I don't do water, but today there is a water tower in Wilcox County in the can county seat. And I learned there that if you listen to community, we can find a way forward. Daniel mentioned my work with um, boys and men. And I got there by visiting a clinic in East St. Louis for women, women and children. But there were no men with them. And I finally decided to get my courage together and say, where are our partners? And I learned that they were in jail or in prison. And so then I knew I had to listen again to community and go to the jails and prisons. And I am now really focused on reentry and the issues of boys and men, but I want everyone to understand that I'm really working for women too, because we have so much of the burden of raising children and keeping community together because we decide to give the load to the women. Zora Neale Hurston used to wrote once that the African-American man is the mule of the world. He has to tote, they give him everything to tote, but he don't have to carry it. He pass it on to his woman. And I think that is still a part of what is true today. And it's part of why I continue to work. I um, thank you for this wonderful honor. And I also thank you for the opportunity for me to continue to listen and learn. I, whenever you see something that's wrong, you have a responsibility to respond. And that is what I do, even though there are times I think, maybe you don't need to do with this anymore, but you can't stop. So I'm here, I'm happy to be with you. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you everyone for honoring me and being present today. My goodness. Well, thank you, Dr. Treadwell, for those gracious and inspiring remarks. You know, I think you are the epitome of community engagement research. And thank you for blazing that trail for all of us. You know, in the spirit of continuing Dr. Treadwell's legacy, it is now my distinct honor to present our inaugural award, the 2022 Henri Treadwell Distinguished Health Equity Lectureship. This award was created to recognize transformational leaders and scholars who are catalysts for change, leaders and scholars who have made significant contributions towards advancing health equity for all populations. The individuals considered for this award are able to confront and address systemic racism and inequities at their core by developing unique action-oriented strategies and opportunities for systemic change to take place at the intersection of policy and equity. This change advocate and thought-provoking leader is not afraid to stand up for what is right, as we just heard Dr. Treadwell mention, right? For what is just and equitable and is overall committed to the care and improvement of human life. The honoree selected today continues to be that driving force, a force that creates opportunities and possibilities that should be inherently afforded to all people, regardless of skin color, ethnicity, sex, gender, ability status, sexual orientation, religion, cultural backgrounds, or any other descriptive characteristics that can be used to discriminate against individuals. The first recipient of the 2022 inaugural Henry, Henry M. Treadwell Distinguished Lectureship is an outstanding public health practitioner. She is a trained epidemiologist and a subject matter expert in health disparities and health equity research, policy and practice, drug and alcohol dependence epidemiology, psychiatric epidemiology, and prevention science. Professor Deborah Fur Holden, who is currently at the Michigan State University, where she is the C.S. Mott Endowed Professor of Public Health. She also serves as the Associate Dean for Public Health Integration and is the Director of the NIH-funded Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions at Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine. And we're very excited to announce that she has been newly appointed the Dean of the New York University's School of Global Public Health, effective July 1st. 
You know, across her endeavors, Dr. Furholden works with local and national policymakers to make the most impact possible, improving data-driven decision-making across a broad range of health topics to mandate equity in all policies. With the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, Dr. Furholden's expertise led to government task force appointments to address public health needs during the crisis. She serves on the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities, the Greater Flint Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Inequity, and the New York City African-American COVID-19 Task Force. She's also working with Dr. Reverend Jesse L. Jackson's Rainbow Push Coalition as co-chair of the Health Committee, the Ruth Mott Foundation Board of Trustees, the editorial board for the Drug and Alcohol Dependence Journal, and as the deputy editor of the journal Health Equity. Funded by the NIMHD, she directs the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions to bring policymakers, community leaders, and researchers together to better improve the health of the Flint community. She also serves as the MSU founding co-director of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, which has been doing incredible work to address striking, in, striking inequities, uh, not only in Flint, but I think things that we have learned from them uh, nationally. So kudos to you all and to the great team there. And then lastly, she is the developer of a novel observational environmental assessment tool, the Neighborhood Inventory for Environmental Typology. Try saying that fast three times, right? This uh, unique tool <clears throat> is unique because it's a systematic social observation tool developed to measure features of the built and social environment that is linked to violence, alcohol, tobacco, and other drug exposure. And her, this tool-based uh, research has been used to promote environmental interventions to prevent and reduce these kinds of exposures. This work is highly collabor collaborative and has fueled a range of partnerships with researchers and policymakers across the country. We thank you so much for developing that tool. Now, it is with great esteem and admiration that I present our 2022 Henri M. Treadwell Distinguished Lectureship Recipient for her exemplary leadership and continued work in enhancing the public health of America, relentless dedication to improving the quality of life for our most vulnerable populations and under-resourced communities, and for advancing health equity overall, Dr. Deborah Furholden. Dr. Furholden, welcome and congratulations. The floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. I'm exhausted just hearing all of those things that you say I do. I'm like, I guess I do do all of that stuff. So and we just scratch the surface, right? <laughs> right. I'm just like, wow. So I'm really honored um, to be here. And I'm really um, excited to just share with you all um, to stand in the seat of people like Dr. Treadwell um, is an honor beyond anything I could ever say with words. Um, just thank you for having me. Thank you for who you are as a champion. I should be on your PR team because the political and social determinants of health and 150 years of Obamacare, I am a huge advocate for both of those and know that I am greatly moved and inspired by who you are, who you have been and continue to be for this fight in health equity. Thank you. Yes. So I want to talk a little bit about my past. I'm going to try to get through all of this um, and leave some time for questions. But what I really want to talk about is my work, and I'm going to minimize everything. So I will not be able to see the chat or the Q&A. So if you all want me to stop, somebody has to interrupt because I'm going to try to like let it rip and get it all in. But what I really want to talk about, because to me, it really has felt like a fight, fighting for health equity solutions. And my big game in life is a world that works for everyone. And I really truly believe that this fight for health equity is about that. It's about building a world that works for everyone. And what I always say is equity is something that we espouse as a value. Um, we talk about it a lot, but I do believe for our global society and definitely in the United States, it is a very, very weak muscle for us. Um, and so again, I just honor and appreciate all the great work um, that we're all doing. And I'm happy to share a little bit about my experience and where I think we need to be going. Uh-oh. Let me advance, hold up. Too many, um, I got too many uh, windows going and it won't let me advance my slides, hold up, what's going on? 
Now that literally never happens. Okay, give me one second. Take your time, don't get flustered, you're good. I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> oh, it's because I'm on the wrong screen. Okay, there we go. You know what, I'm just gonna start this all the way over. Cause it, I like literally my screen just froze. Let's see, will that work? There we go. Okay, cooking with gas. So if you know me, Everybody calls me Deborah for Holden. I'm a, I'm a really be authentic with y'all today. And I'm going to crack my chest open and give you a little bit of my heart. Everybody that knows me growing up calls me Lil Debbie. And anybody from the DC area knows they got these little treats called Lil Debbie snack cakes. So everybody that I grew up with literally calls me Lil Debbie snack cake. And I was born in Washington, DC. I grew up in Sea Pleasant, Maryland, right outside of DC in Prince George's County. Um, I love Sea Pleasant. One of the people of note from Sea Pleasant is Kevin Durant, who was a, a, a very prominent NBA um, player. It's a very small place, but I, I live the experience of health disparities coming from Sea Pleasant. And I didn't find out until I went to college and I had friends who were suffering the loss of great grandparents and grandparents. And by the time I went to college, I had one living parent and no living grandparents. My dad died of 37, at 37 of a ruptured brain aneurysm. My mom died when I was 35, she was 50, I was 34, she was 56, and she died of an asthma attack, things that we don't typically think about people um, dying from. According to the FBI, the annual incidence of violence in Sea Pleasant is about one in 33 people will be the victim of a violent crime. So I come from a loving place, but I also come from a tough place where I understand the real impact of what Daniel calls these social and political determinants of health. Because what I'll tell you about the people that I know from C. Pleasant, we want the same thing for our children that everybody wants for their children. We want safe and supportive schools. We want safe communities. We want places for our kids to play outdoors. We want fair opportunities. So I just honor and acknowledge where I come from. I am Lil Debbie from C. Pleasant. Uh, I went right from C. Pleasant to Johns Hopkins University, both undergrad and graduate. I graduated from high school in Oxon Hill, Maryland at Potomac High School, go Braves. In 1992, I got my bachelor's degree from Johns Hopkins in natural sciences and public health. I was a pre-med major. I stumbled into public health. I ended up going right into a PhD program and I got my PhD at 24 uh, from Johns Hopkins in public health with a concentration in drug and alcohol dependence epidemiology. I did a postdoc from 1999 to 2000 in psychiatric epidemiology and a postdoc in 2000 to 2001 in prevention science. Notice you don't see disparities, equity, policy, anywhere in my background and training, because honestly, when I was coming up through the ranks, formal programs to train us in that work did not exist. Would have been my professional homes. I started off as a professor at Johns Hopkins University. I got this deep seated desire to work with my people. So I left Hopkins and became an assistant professor at the Morgan State University in Baltimore, go Bears. I then left Morgan and I went to a research firm called the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation because I found it hard to manage. So for any of my young academics, I feel you. I found it hard to manage all of the work of teaching and advising and, and service and also to get my program of research going. So I did go to Pyre where I, in one year, secured my first three grants. So I became the recipient of three R01s as a PI in April of 2005. I then went back to Johns Hopkins, wanted to do practice work, moonlighted and doubled as the director of prevention for the city of Baltimore. And then I left there and answered the call to come to Flint. I lived in Flint for two years as an adolescent and it really pulled on my heart when I saw what was happening in Flint around the Flint water crisis. And I joined the Michigan State University Flint campus. And as you all know, in July, I will be assuming the role as the Dean of the NYU School of Global Public Health. I put all this up in all these arrows to say, this was not a linear path. I was in and out of academia, um, trying to find ways to get what was in my soul expressed out in the world. And all I can tell you is if your path is not linear, that's just perfect. But for all of these experiences, I wouldn't have um, the fight and the might that I have today. Some of the things in my life that I love, I love being a mom. These are my children. I'm also a grandma. Um, this is my granddaughter, India. She's seven months old. She's the light of my life. 
Um, I love family. I love this picture. I call it the then and now. That's my cousin, Nia, who's the second PhD in my family. She's a neuroscientist graduate of Wayne State University. And that's my cousin, Raymond Boone. And you can see them at Nia's third birthday party. And you can see them now at my 45th birthday party. I love a challenge. I took on my health and fitness and I ran my first half marathon in 2012, 10 years ago. That's Reverend Deborah Hickman standing beside me. She was my training buddy. She's 25 years my senior and we trained together for a marathon. And I love fighting for what I believe in. And this is a snippet of an article um, that came out of some work that I did in Baltimore, fighting for fair access to substance abuse treatment for people who needed it the most in Baltimore City. Again, it's not been a straight road and it's not always been pretty, um, but here I stand. So I'm in Flint and you all have heard about the Flint water crisis. I always have to give honor and acknowledgement to Flint um, because I love this city. I lived here as an adolescent. I didn't really love it back then because I came from DC and I felt like I had gone from a big city to a small town. I really now have a much better appreciation for what it is to be in Flint because this city has really embraced me and I tell people all the time, what happened in the city of Flint would have wiped a lot of cities off the map. Like many other American cities, it's a shrinking city. It's a majority minority, majority African-American city. And the city was poisoned. I'm not gonna go into the details of what happened. I hope you all are familiar with it, but I wanna be really clear. This was an act of environmental racism and what white supremacy looks like at its finest. We have never had anything like this happen in the state of Michigan and in any other city. And we are now facing a very similar water crisis in the city of Benton Harbor, Michigan, which is the blackest city in the state of Michigan. It's about 85% um, African-American. I'm gonna share along the way a couple of lessons that I learned about Flint. But I would ask you to be my partners in us trying to dispel this notion of Flint and other cities being resilient. Because the notion of resilience rep uh, implies that we can continue to recover and come back from these adversities. And the real fight for health equity solutions in a world that works for everyone is about preventing these type of injustices from happening in the first place. So let Flint be our beacon um, and an example for us that yes, we can thrive and we can strive and persist in, the, persist in the face of these inequities, but I'm really fighting for a world where these things are no longer the status quo. So what health equity solutions are not? And the reason I wanted to start here is because oftentimes when we say health equity or we say health disparities, people will collapse those things. When we talk about solutions, people already have ideas about it. So I wanna dispel a few things and tell you what health equity solutions are not. They are not change or improvement. Solutions are solutions, not incremental change or improvement. I really don't even believe it's progress. And I believe that we've made a lot of progress, but what I'm really fighting for, many of us are fighting for is a transformation. And it's also not a quick fix. We oftentimes try to put a little bit of icing on top of mud and call it a cake. And I would share with you a story um, of me and my daughter. And I had my graphic illustrator make this for me. Um, she was a baker. She was about six years old and we baked our first cake together from scratch. And as we were getting all the ingredients together and we're baking the cake and we mix it up and we put it in the oven. As I'm cleaning up, she's standing at this oven and we have a double mounted, a double wall oven that's mounted into the wall. And she's on her little step stool and the light is on and she's watching the cake bake. And as I'm cleaning up, I noticed the box of Domino sugar was on the counter and it was unopened. We had baked the entire cake and did not put the sugar in. And she looks over at me and she says, mom, what's wrong? I said, well, nothing's wrong, honey, but we made a mistake. We baked the cake and we forgot to put the sugar in. And in her six-year-old brilliance and beauty and naivete, she simply said, can't we just sprinkle some on top? And I laughed and we laughed because of course, you know, you can't sprinkle sugar on top of a cake and get the sweetness into it. We had to rebake the cake, but I feel like oftentimes that's what we do with equity. Our very society was founded and built with people of African heritage being considered property or three fifths of a person. So our society was built with inequity baked in, and now we're trying to sprinkle it on top and call it a cake. So I'm gonna challenge you all as I go through this to be thinking about that. 
Where are we looking for a quick solution, a quick fix, a little bit of change or improvement, but not really dealing with the fact that fundamentally we've got a key ingredient, equity, that wasn't baked into the cake. So where do I see health equity solutions are housed? Where do I think they're located? I'll talk a little bit later about upstream and downstream, but real solutions are upstream. What you will find downstream are mainly fixes. And we oftentimes are trying to program our way out of problems. We create programs that oftentimes are focused on people as if the problem is with the people. When oftentimes we know, in fact, it's the systems and the structures and the policies that have inequity baked into them that are the problem, but we don't create solutions that match the level of the problem. And in order to really address these solutions, we have to deal with race and most importantly, racism, white privilege and white supremacy to achieve health equity. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean. What are some of the barriers that we face in this work? And you'll see here, I've got my illustration. We've got politicians and they're big and they've got the mallet. And then we've got the little old public health guy over there. And I think we all saw during COVID how politics have clobbered public health. We've got problems around data driving policy and intervention. I tell people all the time, evidence does not equal policy. Data oftentimes does, does not drive policy. Politicians drive policy. And if you're lucky, you can use data to influence a politician to influence policy. But there isn't, in my experience, a direct relationship between data and evidence and policy. There are many things that we know that we simply don't act on. Another barrier is political will. And I do say this issue around equity has devolved to a zero sum game with winners and lo losers. And it leaves me and others often asking the question, does anyone in power really care about equity? We talk about it, but where does it show up um, in our laws and in the enforcement of those laws? I think another barrier is we are a very fast food society. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, we can't do that. It'll take too much money or it'll take too much time. And surely to unravel more than 400 years of systematic inequity and oppression, we might not get the results in one year, in a decade, or even a generation. Some results will be immediately measurable and visible, and visible, and some of them, the unraveling of race and poverty and class and classism and sexism and, 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 and geographic inequity and their associated consequences will have to be deliberate and we'll have to do that over time, accepting that some things we'll see immediate results from and some we're gonna see evolve and unravel over time. And then I think another big barrier is pettiness and it's pettiness across the board. Pettiness, political meddling and many of those things have really hit some of our communities the hardest. In communities that are wealthier, better resourced, the impact of political meddling and pettiness sometimes is negligible but it tends to be most impactful in already marginalized populations and communities. All right, so now we're gonna go to, what do I see as some of the solutions? And in this fight for a world that works for everyone, what should we be doing? The first thing is we gotta track disparities. We have to use the existing data that we have and we have to address these massive infrastructure gaps at all levels. As an example, we saw in the state of Michigan during the COVID pandemic, there were laws initially around the rollout of the vaccine, prioritizing older adults to be first in line to get their vaccines. And what happened is the state was required by the CARES Act to collect data, five demographic variables on every person who received a vaccine. It included race and ethnicity. It included some geographic measure for most places that was zip code. Several measures were required to be collected. And I'm sorry, my laptop, is about to die. I apologize, it's plugged in, but it's not working. This is unorthodox, but give me one second. I so apologize. Okay, thank you all. That one wasn't working. I got a new one. Okay, we're cooking with gas. So they were required to collect these five variables, but here's what happened. 
when we got our first rollout of data, and I'm not picking on Michigan, Michigan has done a much better job of many other places of tracking data specifically around COVID vaccinations. The first 1.5 million doses of vaccine, 44% of the data were missing race, 70% of the data was missing ethnicity. Less than 0.01% of the data were missing age. So clearly we had the capacity to collect these demographic data, but we just had what I call the unnecessary and unacceptable omission of race and other key demographic data. So we can't put our heads in the sand and not do the work to collect the data that would allow us to even track disparities. And people ask me all the time, well, how do we track them? I hope everybody here knows, but if not, I'm gonna tell you, it's very basic. The first thing is we have to confront the data. We have to collect it, and then we have to confront what I call health data disparities. And I'll tell you what I mean by health data disparities in just a second. But the first thing is we have to collect the data. The second thing is we have to disaggregate the data. This is not rocket science. You have to disaggregate the data by these key demographic variables. And that centers around race, poverty, insurance status, whether or not people live in rural, urban, or semi-urban communities, whether or not somebody is a sexual or gender minority, we have to actually disaggregate the data by many of these variables that we know are primary drivers of the disparities that we see. And when I'm talking about disparities, I'm specifically talking about the differences that we see downstream, a little bit different from the inequities, i.e. the more upstream structural and political drivers of those disparities that we see downstream. We then have to make sure that we do not control or adjust the way the disparity. When I was training in public health back in the 90s, we used to treat race and um, as socioeconomic status and education as nuisance variables. And we would just control them out and make statements like, after controlling for race and gender and all these other things, we found a relationship between A and B not realizing that those variables were primary drivers of the relationship that we saw between A and B. Not because there was anything inherently baked into being a racial ethnic minority or being a particular gender group that would drive that, but it's what those being in those groups would give rise to. And I always tell people, it's not race that is the social determinant of health, it's racism. Race gives way to experiences of racism and that's what causes those differences that we see in health and opportunities for optimal health. So we cannot treat it any longer as noise or nuisance. Do not control or adjust it away. And then we have to let the data speak for itself. I understand as a scientist, we should be driven by hypotheses that is very separate and distinct from being driven by an agenda. We need hypotheses-driven research, not agenda-driven research health data disparities, huge area that I'm taking on now, three features of it. The first feature is the unacceptable and unnecessary omission of race and other key demographic data from health and public health data. Go back to the example in Michigan, again, not picking on Michigan, but it was unacceptable that this federal resource was to all of these states and they simply didn't do the job of collecting the data that would be needed to say if we were fairly and equitably actually getting shots in arms and getting this important resource to communities that needed it the most. It's unnecessary, it's unacceptable. I've been looking at this in electronic medical records and lo and behold, we find that about 30% of electronic medical records are missing these key demographic data for any individual or any encounter that one might have in the healthcare system. So even our ability to talk about health care disparities and health care inequities has been greatly dampened by this unacceptable and unnecessary omission of these important demographic variables. Even more egregious in the second piece is poor quality data for certain populations like racial ethnic minorities, people who are uninsured or underinsured, persons with disabilities, people living in rural communities. Again, I am now in a deep dive into health data, understanding that what you get is just a poor quality medical record 
for some of these already marginalized groups. And this really costs people their lives and their vitality. My uncle died um, about a month ago because he had a known allergy that was in his electronic medical record on some encounter at some point, he went to the hospital for one problem, was given an antibiotic that he had a severe allergic reaction to, had a heart attack and subsequently died two weeks later. Completely preventable, but a function of his electronic health record is just of poor quality than his wealthier and whiter peers. And then the last piece is, we oftentimes do not treat people or look at them in context. And many of our health data do not include contextual variables like any of these social and political determinants of health. So we've got well-meaning providers who are giving recommendations and, and, and making uh, suggestions for their patients that don't map onto their lived experience. Saying things like, oh, well, if you don't have a car, walk more in your community. If you can't get to the gym, walk in your community without any understanding that they live in a community that doesn't have sidewalks, that's not highly walkable, that's high violence, et cetera. We hand them prescriptions, not understanding that there's no pharmacy near their house or the pharmacies that are near them are price gouging and it's cost prohibitive. So we do have this need to do a better job of addressing health data disparities. I published a paper recently in the American Journal of Public Health. This came out in April of last year. And lo and behold, even in death, we do a worse job with the health record of African-Americans. What we looked at in this paper is the classification of opioid-involved overdose deaths over a 20-year period. And lo and behold, what we find is the death record is of poorer quality for African-Americans and Hispanics than it is for their white counterparts. So even as we do the work to try to understand, have we moved the needle on opioid-involved overdose death, there's so much missing data in the records of people of color compared to their white counterparts we have limited capacity to really speak about this with power and authority. And it's unnecessary and to me, it's unacceptable. All right, next place where I think we need to be headed. We need to provide valid frameworks and not just words. People in my opinion will bastardize the language of equity and people start using it because it has cachet. They don't know what they're saying. Oftentimes it's not the person who's the most qualified, but the person who's the most senior or the most connected who gets the mic. And we need it to be more than just words. We talk about disparities. I say disparities, I'm talking about differences. These things tend to be person-centered, they're downstream. And if we were talking about the distinction between, for example, race and racism, that's where race would be. We'd have racial disparities. We talk about inequities. I'm talking about systematic unfairness I'm dealing with systems and structures, not things that are person-centered. We're talking more upstream, and that's where you would find racism. Real quick, I'm sure this group has it, but I, I'm going to say it over and over again. Race is not a social determinant of health. It is racism. Race is a social construct. Racism is the systemic subordination of members of a target racial group with relatively low social control and power. In this country, that's primarily Blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, Asians. If we it broadened it beyond race, we can name all the other groups. Members of target groups who are, by the systematic design, have less social power and control. And that subordination is supported both by acts of individuals, but more importantly, by cultural norms and values, by institutional structures and the practices of our society. Again, it's the thing that got baked in from the founding of this country. We know that these varying approaches and the framing matters. I'm sure you've all seen this. We think of this as equality. You've got the guys at the game. They come to the game differentially uh, able to see over the fence because they're of differing heights. In an equality model, you take this resource, the boxes, you spread them out evenly. In an equity model, you redistribute those resources based on need. And we all go rah, rah when we think about equity this way. But then it's important. And the thing that Daniel talks about are the social and political determinants of health. Because if we those things and the systematic and structural barriers, note that the resources are now no longer needed. 
those boxes, let's say they represent funding for healthcare, can be used in other ways if we would do a much better job at dealing with the systematic and structural barriers. So approach and framing matters. I live in the state of Michigan right now. There was a huge movement here and they were actually successful, our GOP-led legislature, in banning critical race theory from even being discussed in schools. And we keep asking this question of exactly what does that mean? Well, we know what it means. They don't want to confront these things because it makes people feel bad. And what I always say is if I can live and my children and my children's children can live under the weight of it, surely you can allow a conversation for it to be out on the forefront. So the next thing that I think we have to do is we have to grapple with the tough conversations and have an authentic reckoning with our past and what that means for our present and our future. We cannot get away from this and we can't turn a blind eye and pretend that that's old stuff. No, those things and what how our society was built very much has a modern day um, influence and a modern day appearance in our current landscape. We know that poverty and race, for example, are not an equal opportunity experience. And the combined effect of living in poverty and being a racial ethnic minority is much greater than the single effect of any one of those alone. As a matter of fact, we've got strong data. Poverty is, and the incidence of poverty has been persistent and worse for black and brown people than it has been for all other groups in this country. As a matter of fact, we've made very little progress in this. And over the last 40 years, we've got about a third of black children who were and still are living in poverty. There's also what I call the black tax, the persistent and intergenerational impact of poverty. And what this shows, and this is from the Urban Institute, if you ever lived in poverty, even one year as a child, overall 35% of people who lived in poverty or were poor even one year in life as a, as a child, about 15% of them will live in persistent poverty as an adult. If you're white, about 20% of white children who ever lived in poverty for one year, about 10% will live in poverty as an adult. If you're black, the number is 43% and 41% are living in poverty as an adult. It's saying there's something about rising out of poverty that others are able to do better and have more opportunity to than people who are um, black and brown. Again, grappling with these tough conversations and that reckoning. And this was like from 1920, but it does point to something that I think is really important. This was an article that came out in Newsweek. All coronavirus deaths in St. Louis, Missouri had been African-American. And this is about three, four weeks into the pandemic. And the reason that I put this up is there a demographic in the place and have people up in arms. If this read all coronavirus deaths in St. Louis have been children, people would have been up in arms. If it they've all been white, people would have been up in arms. Even if they were all women, people would have been up in arms, but they were all African-American and we just sort of tilted our head and went, wow, that's a shame. We've got to grapple with this conversation and this notion that we have placed a hierarchy on the value of human life and we've deadened our senses to the real impact of what it is to be the beneficiaries and the ones who inherited the oppression and the long-term legacy effects of baked in, built in systematic racism. We also have to resource the solutions. And when I say resource the solutions, um, this is a sort of graphic that I had made. Um, and again, I talk, I've talked a bit about upstream and downstream. So you think what's upstream are, are the issues around equity and inequity. These are the system policies, the funding priorities or the social of got societal norms, enforcement programs, how resources get allocated. And then further downstream are where you see individuals and all of our many programs and treatment and all the healthcare spending um, that happens. But if you go further up, healthcare spending is a function of how resources are allocated. And that's a function of the systems, the laws and the policies and the funding priorities. So we've got to go all the way up top and make sure that we've got systems, laws and funding priorities that map on 
to the great needs that we know because all that stuff flows downstream. There's a business case to be made for equity and preparedness. And I am using the example of Flint, Michigan because I think it's a really great one. So I say inequity and racism has a real cost. The Flint water crisis has cost more than a billion dollars of taxpayer money. And that's only accounting for two things, the water infrastructure improvements that were needed, which were over $300 million and the uh, class action settlement, which is about uh, $650 million. Just those two things alone. Countless other dollars have been spent. But if I look just at those two things, we've spent a million dollars of taxpayer money and we haven't fully solved the problem. What was the cost to upgrade the water treatment system pre-water crisis? It was just under a million dollars. So saying we didn't have the money to invest just under a million dollars to improve the water treatment and water handling system has now cost us more than a billion dollars of taxpayer money. What was the cost of adding an anti-corrosive to the water, which could have largely present, prevented the corrosions of pipe and the leaching of lead and many other problems that arose during the Flint water crisis? Depending on who you ask, it was somewhere about 81 to $150 a day. And again, now it's cost us a billion dollars. What is gonna be the cost to human capital and human potential? That's to be determined. We don't know. We're doing everything that we can to make sure that people recover, to make sure that our children who were exposed to Flint water from the time they were conceived and in utero in their first year of life, we're doing everything that we can, but even those programs and those resources are very costly. It asks the bigger question, what is the global cost of inequity for communities? What's the ROI of equity? I think we'll see as we start to continue to unpack this and really build the business case for equity and preparedness, we'll find that there's better return on investment. This million dollars or this $150 a day could have avoided the tremendous loss of human capital and potential and saved us more than a billion dollars of taxpayer money. I'm working with a, a strong group of partners on a model that we call eradicate racism. We're building that out, um, leveraging the work of the Kellogg Foundation, their truth, racial healing and transformation work to build these public health approaches to jettison a global pandemic. And the biggest problem that we're facing here is getting resources for the work. But my point is we have to resource those solutions. We have to act at the highest level and not necessarily the one that feels good. And I always tell politicians, please don't come to my neighborhood and kiss children. Please don't come and plant a garden. I need you to be in the state house in implementing laws and policies. You are a politician, you are a legislator. It is your job to legislate. And then it is your job to ensure that that legislation has enforcement attached to it because legislation without enforcement is akin to gums without teeth. We oftentimes will easily get seduced by the thing that feels good. This is an example. And I'm not picking on Johns Hopkins. I am doubly trained at Johns Hopkins. This is what volunteers from Hopkins were doing in uh, communities around Baltimore following the uprising uh, when Freddie Gray was murdered by Baltimore City Police. We went out, students went out, we cleaned up. This was one of a, a high ranking uh, Hopkins administrator, Hopkins staff standing shoulder to shoulder with community, helping to clean the streets up and pick trash up. And while that made people feel good, Hopkins is the largest employer in the state of Maryland. They are a nonprofit institution that gives them a certain calling and a certain mission. And I thought that's just not sufficient. What is Hopkins gonna do to help rebuild and restore all of those businesses? We are a, 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 a non-taxed entity. The, the city of Baltimore loses hundreds of millions of dollars of taxes every year because we are a tax exempt entity. And so what did they do? They've risen to the occasion and they've teamed up and they led the charge teaming up with about 25 businesses to expand economic opportunities in Baltimore and created what's called the Be Local Initiative, an investment of $69 million in programs to build, hire and buy locally. That's the kind of bar that we need to put on academic institutions. So while going out to the community and standing shoulder to shoulder with people, maybe is a right thing to do and it feels good, we have to put that bar on ourselves 
to operate and act at the highest level. We have to plug the leaky like pipeline with data, science, evidence, and what I call just incentives. As an academic, I will tell you, this is what we call the 17 year odyssey. And in short, it takes about 17 years for 14% of research to ever be translated into anything that's practice-based. That means the other 86% dies on the vine, it dies in an unfunded uh, grant application, it lives in a journal somewhere, it lives on somebody's CV, but it actually never really did anything to move the needle forward. And we've got all of these places along the leaky pipeline and think back to that graphic I had where we talked about upstream and priorities for funding. There's a really great movement afoot through the NIH Common Fund to really do the kind of transformative work that will address and really deal with and put resources in the hands of institutions and investigators who've historically been marginalized in this process. And we have to hold them to account to standing true to that mission. We know talent and brilliance is very much evenly distributed, but how NIH and many of these other agencies have distributed the resources has not been evenly distributed. Historically serving, uh, minority serving institutions have categorically been left out of the bounty of NIH uh, and other federal agencies resources. So we have to be a demand for that. And we've got to bridge that research to practice gap. Another thing that we have to deal with, and I'm speaking as an academic, is we've got very perverse incentives for performance. The kind of work that we know we need to do, doing it with communities in partnership with communities, often doesn't yield the, the number and, 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 and uh, type of publications that are needed for tenure and promotion. So in academics, it's almost like it's not a safe place to go back and do the kind of work that you're really called to do because it won't yield the kind of academic credentials that you need to successfully navigate these systems around tenure and promotion. So I put this article in here because I think it does a really great job of talking about how do we maintain scientific integrity in a climate of perverse incentives and hyper competition. And that's a cultural revolution that's also needed so that the academy is a place where we don't value the work of a bench scientist more so than the work of a social behavioral scientist. Because you can develop every innovative medication you want in the lab. If we can't actually get uptake of it in communities, it will make no difference. So we need to see value equally um, across those disciplines. And then there's this also budding phenomenon of health equity tourists. This is a really great article. There's a scientific publication that goes along with it. I will happily share this presentation. I've got lots of citations um, down in the notes and it talks about how white scholars are colonizing research on health disparities. It's become hip to be a health equity researcher or a health disparities researcher. And unfortunately, people who aren't steeped in the work, the language, don't have a track record of success, have somehow gotten the mic and are at the forefront and they disproportionately are able to get their papers published in high impact journals and somehow get you know, branded as the real experts when they are actually not really steeped in the work. So I think we really need to deal with that pipeline and deal with this problem around how do we create spaces for underrepresented scholars, for people from minority serving institutions to not only have the mic, but to really be solidified as the people who really are the experts and the future of this work. We need to include the valued voice of community and be honest about what it is and what it's not. Uh, this is a, 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 a model that we created called the Continuum of Community Engagement and Research. We say there's no real wrong door, but a little bit of a cautionary tale. And this is published in Progress and Community Health Partnerships. Um, I'm a hopeless romantic, so I watched this show called Married at First Sight. Um, and lo and behold, most of those marriages, these are people who said they are committed to being married and then they meet their spouse at the altar and they get married and do this eight week exper experiment. Most of those marriages don't work out. So the hopeless, hopeless romantic in me is very sad about that. As a researcher, what I know is I wouldn't advise people with no relationship, no trust, no history to jump into full blown community-based participatory research in communities where they work. You've got to deal with those contextual factors. And then you've also got to ongoingly ag address some of the equity indicators things like power and control, decision-making, benefit, resource sharing. Who owns the data? 
you know, what happens when the project ends with all the iPads and the laptops that were purchased? You've got to deal with all of those types of things. And you've got to do the real work of building trust and relationship and think about where you are and then be honest with community. If you would like to do community-driven research or you'd like to do community-based participatory research, but you don't have that history and that trust, you might have to start off with something that's just community informed or community cons um, um, consultation. No wrong door, but again, it's about acknowledging what communities don't need are more helicopter researchers coming in with a lot of enthusiasm and great ideas, helicoptering out with data and publications and things like that, and the community is left no better off for it. Um, we do a lot of work uh, in my group and study more than just risk um, and resilience. And we believe that community and commu community participatory approaches are really where we're gonna get the best knowledge. Why? Because people know their lived experience. And one of the things I've learned about being in Flint is you got some real water experts here. People who had never heard of the lead copper rule or the PFAS or trihalomethanes or any of that stuff. And you've got people who are now experts on all things water. Guess what they're also an expert on? Their lived experience in their community. And so it's important that we not only work in partnership with them, but that we include them also in the scientific process. And if they want that we include them in the scientific dissemination to also solidify um, their expertise. And here uh, we work with uh, Ms. Ella Green Moten, who is the community co-lead of our data and methods core for our Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions. And what I always say is it's the carrot versus the stick. So we can incentivize people or we can try to force people to do the right thing. And what I offer people is if we really make prominent seats at the table for community, we can have truth and power at the same table at the same time. And I just maintain that we absolutely need community voice. So what do I say to my community stakeholders? I tell them there's no magic bullet. If, if you can go fast, if you go alone, but to go far, we gotta go together. I tell them often be a demand for a seat at the table and not any old seat, a good seat. And if you don't get a good seat, just say no. I, I encourage them only participate in explicit conspiracies. Don't participate with me it's to check off a box and wants to throw some money your way. It needs to be explicit. You need to know exactly what the relationship is and is not. And if it doesn't make sense, say no, because there's strength in numbers. And when communities bind together and create a wall and say, academic partners, if you want to work with us, you can do it, but you won't work on us or on our behalf without our permission. And I always tell people you have power in your voice, in your vote, and in how you spend your money. So use that power wisely. The last thing I'll say is it's very important that we get equity baked in. It was very endearing when my six-year-old offered to sprinkle it on top. It's unacceptable at this stage in the game for us to allow people in positions of power and authority to do that. We want equity to be mandated. Our natural drift is to an equity. If equity really matters, it has to be law. It would inspire researchers to, to better partner. Federal mandates would push states to figure a lot of this stuff out. State mandates would inspire communities of practice. So if equity really does matter, it should be mandated, enforced, and attached to resources. For any young and budding scholars out there, if people ask, you tell them. If there's goodwill, there's a legislative way. I'm gonna skip this just for time. And I would encourage any trainees and early career folks, stay on purpose. Do not chase funding opportunities that don't make sense for you. I would encourage people, find that sweet spot between the things that you love, the things that you're great at, what's wanted and needed in the world and the things that you can get paid for. You don't have to be poor in the fight for equity. This is not a, a, a mission that we take on because we wanna be rich, but you should be able to be solvent and also be economically vibrant. When you find that sweet spot there, I believe you will find your purpose. That's my contact information. This is the last slide that I will probably ever have in a public presentation. Well, I will put my cell phone number up. So I honor you all. I appreciate you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in the great shadow of Dr. Treadwell. Thank you for your time and your attention. And I just ask everybody stay 
and courage. We are in this together. Thank you so much. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Deborah, for, for holding. That was awesome, powerful, authentic, everything that we needed to hear today. And it was just such an honor. And I know that our question had, or our audience has many questions for you. You did such an awesome job. Um, I can listen to you over and over and over again. And it looks like our chat box agrees as well. Simply amazing. And so we're going to transition. And it brings me great honor. I'm Jerry Stroud, the Associate Project Director here at the Satchel Health Leadership Institute. We are going to transfer into a couple of questions um, from our audience today. I'll kind of kick us off with uh, some, a couple of questions for about 10 to about 10 to 15 minutes if we can uh, pardon some of your time. But you mentioned a lot today in this, uh, in this um, Civil Rights Act that we have now, but we wanna know, uh, we have some great leaders that have come before our time. Um, as you know, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, just, just a lot of great historical leaders. And they all had unique strategies in addressing direct and structural racism. What are some strategies we can utilize to address the injustices we see today in public health? And what are some of the qualities a leader in this, in this movement should possess? Yeah, so a couple of things. So I think any leader who would do this work, I think you got to stand in the Ida B. Wells tradition. Ida B. Wells fought her whole life for anti-lynching legislation. Do you know we're just getting that now? And I have had a lot of my young scholars and early career scholars that I work with who get very, very frustrated. Again, because I think we live in a fast food society. So I tell people, if you really want to do this work, you, you almost have to forfeit your right to expect to see that change immediately. I wouldn't give up on it. And I'm fighting for change right now. I want to see it in my lifetime, but I'm not fighting because I'm going to see it in my lifetime. I'm fighting because it's the right thing to do. And with every fiber in my being, I will not let it rest. I will not let it rest until I'm in a world that works for everyone. So I think that's the thing. And that's why I think well-being is so important. We talk about work-life balance a lot. And I tell people work-life balance is not a destination. It's not like Acapulco. You're never going to get there, right? It's a value. And if you value having a life that works, you want to be a great parent, a great partner, a great son or daughter, a great friend, you've got to hold those things as a value. And they'll constantly be little tweaks that you have to make to get those things adjusted. So I tell people your well-being is the most important thing in your work, because if you aren't well and if you aren't fit for the fight, then it, it won't work. So well-being is most important. Some of the strategies that I think we have to deal with, we've got to be a demand for fair, equitable access to the resources to solve these problems. Just point blank, period. And like I said, there's this push now at the NIH, and I'm just using that agency as an example, to level the playing field and make sure that minority serving institutions, underrepresented investigators and investigators who are working in underrepresented communities are actually a priority in the resources and how they get allocated. I think we have to continue to do that work and we need people in different places. We need people at the NIH. We need people at minority serving institutions. We need people at majority institutions. We need people in community. We need people in local health departments. We need people in state health departments. We need people in grassroots community organizations. And we have to value people where they are and create opportunities for them to bloom in place. Good, good. Certainly, definitely um, agree with that. And you mentioned um, meeting people and actually meeting them where they are. And I know that uh, sometimes we have, or you've probably experienced, even in your uh, career journey and in, even in just in your uh, lifetime journey, just maybe some opposing people who may not think like you, may not move like you. And so in trying to really just relate to people that racism is true and it does happen and we know that it happens, but what do you do when you encounter someone of the opposing that doesn't believe that, hey, this is not happening, this is not here? How do you really speak to that, speak to that person? I mostly don't, to be honest, um, because here's what I'll tell you. The power of a white person checking another white person is unparalleled. There are so many people who are in the choir, but they're singing a little off key. They might not know the words, et cetera. For the people whose heels are dug in and they don't believe that racism is real, I don't waste my time with them. 
Yeah. What I will do is talk to their nieces, nephews, aunts, cousins, neighbors <laughs> who are in the conversation because the power of them having a conversation with them is unparalleled. Yes. They are the trusted, credible messenger to them. And that's when we talk about allyship, that's what I need you to do. Check your racist uncle, check your you know, racist grandparents. They won't hear me or see me and I can't be exhausted mm -hmm. by that. So I do see the value of allyship and I choose to spend my time and my energy with people who are open to and up for the conversation. And I implore them to be ambassadors with the people in their world and in their affinity groups for whom hearing it from them will make the biggest difference. Awesome, awesome. We're gonna shift a little bit. Um, and I know that you mentioned uh, John Hoskins and different other um, uh, organizations or institutions. And as we know, um, there are historical and current events that may have altered the trust of minority populations, such as the infamous, of course, Flint water crisis, Tuskegee trials and uh, Puerto Rico birth control trials. How do we win that trust back of these communities who continue to be uh, mistreated? And um, are the very communities who are suffering from uh, most of the COVID-19 pandemic and other disparities? And then how do we reinforce the credibility of these same institutions or various agencies now that uh, positively have positively actions or taken positive actions to move the needle forward? So the short answer is we got to do it over time mm -hmm. and with one good act at a time. Because the reality is a lot of that mistrust is well-earned and valid. I would almost say you're gullible if you just automatically grant trust to a government and to a healthcare system that has not only failed you, but intentionally harmed you. Right. How do you build trust? Think about it. This is basic over time. And once you've earned someone's mistrust, you've got to do the work by having consistent, regular, powerful actions and results that demonstrate and re-implement and restore trust. So I would not expect anybody to just grant trust to a system, a society, structures, and organizations that have earned their mistrust. So it's got to happen over time and with consistent good acts and results. Absolutely. Absolutely. And are there any specific uh, equity issues for which you have found that policy has not um, always been the best way to address the issues and where non-policy tools may not have been um, the most effective way to address these policy issues? So non-policy tools, yeah, I will tell you again, I think a lot of times we do things that feel good mm -hmm. and we don't do things that are evidence-based or that are based in at least promising practices, right? Because oftentimes the bar to become evidence-based is something that's overly academic and doesn't honor the real lived experience of people on the ground floor who are doing the work, right? And so I think what we've got to do is say, we can't just do the things that make us feel good and we need to engage real experts. I was so mad when the former president invited a game show host, an athlete, and an entertainer to the White House to develop a comprehensive violence prevention strategy for Black and brown communities. I'm like, what expertise do they have in violence prevention? Myself and others have devoted our entire careers to it, but a game show host, a celebrity, and an athlete are your go-to people? Mm. So we need to engage real experts in the process. And I do believe we need policy intervention because I believe fundamentally there is nothing wrong in black and brown communities that solving racism won't fix. Absolutely. And I, that's, that's where I stand. Yes, absolutely. It's definitely the core. We have a uh, question from the audience. Um, it's, they say, what is your opinion on how the new CMS REACH model will help address health equity via the value-based care? So I... I think uh, REACH has a lot of potential. The, the most important thing um, uh, for REACH and these other emerging models around value-based care will be how they get implemented. Because you could take anything that has a lot of potential and that's great. Democracy by design should work for all of us. We just know how it's been implemented has not benefited everybody fairly and equitably. So I do think there's a lot of promise in this values-based approach. And I think there's a lot of promise and specifically what they're trying to do with REACH. We actually have a REACH grant here in the city um, of Flint, and we are one of the few sites that got renewed in this current round, but it's, it's all gonna be about how it gets done. Again, which is why I think we need enforcement behind all of these things. 
If you tell somebody, this is how you have to implement this, and this is what you have to demonstrate, and then there's no checks and balances to make sure that it gets implemented that way and that they can either produce those results or a plan for what they'll do if they're not being successful, then we potentially are doing more of the same, which is just throwing a lot of money at problems, creating short-term fixes, and not real long-term health equity-centered solutions. Awesome. I totally agree as well. And as we're about to wrap up our question and answer uh, segment, I want to ask you one uh, really, really great question to conclude. And then we're going to proceed with our program. But as platforms or political agendas can change, as we know, how do we ensure efforts for health equity always remain at the forefront? Sure. So not every position is elected or subject to change. And that's the other thing. So one, we need to use the power of our vote. We shouldn't be giving our vote away anymore. And I feel like sometimes we're voting on the lesser of two evils. Um, and so there's power in the vote and I believe that. But then there's also people, which is why I said we need people everywhere. There are people embedded all throughout government who don't change when elected leaders change. And we need to make sure that we shore those people up and that they're properly supported to do those jobs. We can't just put it all on the hands and all in the in the control of these elected leaders, because as we've seen, they can change real fast. That was phenomenal, um, absolutely phenomenal. I want to I want to once again thank Dr. Fur Holden for such a enriching and inspirational discussion. I mean, I don't I don't know about y'all, but I feel like I just left church. So thank you for taking us to church. I guess we'll go ahead and pass the hat now. But for for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nelson Dunlap. Um, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the chief of staff at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute. It is my earnest hope that everyone viewing this webinar was able to identify their role or even, you know, just their next steps in this movement. You know, as we all, that's all of us, strive to keep health equity at the forefront of the fight for, for racial and social justice. You know, your, your active engagement is imperative and necessary in order to change the negative impacts perpetuated as a result of America's historical uh, role in keeping communities of color from achieving success, a healthy way of life, and economic stability. You know, as we all know, we didn't get to this point alone. You know, it took leaders like Dr. Treadwell to pave the way and pass the baton to present innovators like Dr. Fur Holden to continue this uphill battle. And while we have accomplished many milestones, there are still many contributions that to, to, yet to be made in moving the needle of health equity forward. You know, it requires effort of collaboration novel approaches, equitable representation of our populations, including in data, policy changes, and many more difficult yet attainable challenges. You know, in the words of Dr. Treadwell, it is essential that we develop and elevate those developing and established community leaders and academics who value multidisciplinary in, in interventions that improve health and address the social and political determinants of health. Silos that revere single discipline interventions and that ignore Racial discrimination are not acceptable as we seek health equity. And I believe, and I think I speak for SHLI when I say that individuals that are viewing now and, and, and those that are in this space are the leaders that will continue to power the engine of health equity for our communities across the globe, honestly. You know, it's for this very reason that the Henri Treadwell Distinguished Lectureship, Lectureship will continue to be represented yearly, presented yearly, to encapsulate and embody the works of, and of efforts of health equity champions who choose to uproot systemic inequities by creating actionable solutions undergirded in the health equity from our most vulnerable communities and to not only survive, but to thrive, right? Because we're not, we're not trying to do this. We're not trying to have these conversations. We're not trying to do this work just to get by. It's about making sure the communities that we aim to serve, those who are closest to the pain are not only able to survive, but able to actually thrive and live and truly enjoy their most equitable lives. We hope all of you have enjoyed today's program and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next year. So please put a, put a pin in your calendar. We'll, you know, same time, same channel. Thank you again and uh, be well.